Have you ever wanted to play Uncharted but Marvel and with less engaging gameplay? No? Guardians of the Galaxy, an action-adventure RPG developed by Eidos Montreal and is the second installment of a collaboration between Square Enix and Marvel Entertainment. We play as the titular superhero group from the perspective of Peter Quill and the story follows a ragtag bunch of mercenaries that we know and love from the movies. However, the plot is a completely original story that follows nothing from the MCU, which is something I will discuss my thoughts on later. This is the successor to the original Marvel's Avengers and was released a full year later in 2021 and unlike that dumpster fire we unfortunately have to call a video game this one is actually good and received multiple awards such as adventure game of the year and best narrator for a video game look i decided to pick this up because it was free about a couple months ago on epic and since i already played the first game by square enix i figured what the hell might as well play the second one since it's free so just like that video i'm going to be retelling the story along with my thoughts while playing and since this video did take <clears throat> about two months i'd appreciate it if you please subscribe thanks so when I booted this up for the first time and entered the main menu, I realized that, oh my god, I'm going to have to mute like half of the video game. Yeah, so while I did say that the story is nothing like the MCU, they did take some inspiration involving the soundtrack and that they made half of the music be real songs from the 1980s. Meaning that if anything slipped past while editing and was longer than 5 seconds, this entire video could be copyright claimed and I really don't want to do that because I don't even know how long this is going to be. So if there's any part of the game that plays actual music, I don't know what I'm going to do other than mute the clip and just probably narrate over it. With all that housekeeping out the way, the game begins by paying to a farmhouse in rural Missouri. We start our campaign through a first person perspective of teenager Peter Quill chilling on his bed and DAMN! I mean, <clears throat> our mom comes into the room because come to find out, it's Peter's 13th birthday and wants to celebrate by having cake. After promising our mom that we'll be up in a few moments, the screen fades to black. Just kidding, we're awakened by Drax and the Milano to prepare for a mission. We put on our stupid looking leather jacket and get a glimpse in the mirror and oh my god, why does Peter look like that? Look, of all the ways you could make Star Lord, why did they make him look like a quirked up frat boy straight out of college? <laughs> After an uncomfortably long cutscene of staring in the mirror, we head out the door and are introduced to the other three guardians, Groot, Rocket, and DAMN! I mean, Gamora. We're parked outside of something called the Quarantine Zone, waiting for our opportunity to infiltrate it. We enter through the force field through stolen codes, and Gamora gives us some lore on the place. So, like I said before, the game is a completely original story from the MCU, but all of the prevalent characters and locations actually draw inspiration from different iterations in the comics and movies. As I'm about to explain, in this universe, the events that led to the creation of the Quarantine Zone we're currently in was the Galactic War, which is a galaxy-wide invasion led by Thanos and is a mixture of the Annihilation Way comics and the MCU. Our mission in the Quarantine Zone is to capture a monster for a buyer because, as per usual, the Guardians are broke. We're split into two teams with Peter joining the scouting team and we're off. Our objective is to place thumpers throughout the zone which are devices used to attract monsters and this is where we learn the controls. Quick disclaimer, I played this on mouse and keyboard which in all honesty is the least optimal way to play this. The controls were designed around being able to push multiple buttons at once while in combat and other actionable parts in the story much like the original Avengers game and with having one hand on a mouse it's just not feasible to be pressing that many at the same time so keep that in mind when some parts look a bit scuffed. So where were we? Because we play from the perspective of Peter Quill, this is basically a third person shooter with some added controls. Right button to aim, left button to shoot, and F to dodge that didn't work for the first 5 hours into the story that I had to google to fix. Thanks Square Enix. The added controls we get are so we can activate the Guardian's abilities because what I can only assume is for story purposes we only end up playing as Star Lord. Shift opens up a menu wheel which is how we activate skills and further abilities have to be unlocked by getting skill points which in my opinion is really stupid considering that there is no other leveling system. We also get access to a visor which gives us hints on where to go as well as scan the surrounding environment which I found to be a really cool addition because scanning certain objects gives us in-universe lore that draws inspiration from the comics. We place down the first thumper and follow rocket throughout the quarantine zone. Unlike the first Square Enix installment, this game is linear and single player, meaning that you aren't forced to grind for hours on end doing the same mission so you can level up. Thanks Square Enix. As we head to the second location of the thump where we find out the origin of the goo and no it's not Chef P and her pink sauce gone wrong, we've already been through that. The best way to describe it is galactic super glue with its own thriving ecosystem of parasites that we have to shoot in order to progress. Rocket thought it'd be fun to add a scoreboard for those who could shoot more parasites which I found to be a great way to act as an extension of the tutorial. A little while later Peter ends up falling down a hole and we're ambushed by a pack of some angry durians. This is where we learn the combat and level up system and unfortunately after the combat tutorial my game decided to shit itself. What the f*** is happening? 
After a quick restart, we meet back up with Rocket and Groot and place down the second thumper. We're attacked by some more angry fruit and clear up the wave no problem, learning how to use character abilities in the process. We venture off to the third location of the thumper and this time we're not only jumped by living fruit but also rainbow slugs that I feel are borderline not safe for work. Quick side note, but this game glitches out a lot because my graphics card cannot handle the RTX function while recording, so while I was re-watching the footage, one of the monsters just decides to slide into the frame. But regardless, the three of us clear out the monsters, head to the last location of the thumper, which is inside an abandoned mining rig, and we find the soul stone. I'm not joking. The soul stone releases some kind of monster that honestly looks like the devs were too lazy to make an actual entity, but I'm pretty sure that that pixelated monster isn't going to be integral in any way related to the actual story. Right? With that little fun, unimportant cutscene out of the way, we go further into the mining rig, fall down another hole because Peter is heavier than Queso apparently, and get attacked by some tentacle monsters. Nice try, but I have seen this plot before. Once we fight our way out and get everyone together, we are forced into another battle and we learn about another unique mechanic called a call to action. Basically what it is, is mandatory team bonding where Peter inspires everyone through a short speech. The entire team is granted extra damage and extremely short ability cooldowns, and the strength and duration of the buff is actually dependent on the dialogue you choose as Peter. Unfortunately, this is also one of the parts where I have to mute the clip because they decided that the music after the huddle would be 90s music, and I wish I could convey the surreal feeling of having Rick Astley's never gonna give you up being blasted into your ear while the game is bugging out right in front of you. All of us clear up the monsters and finally place down the last thumper to call the thing we've been searching for. It attracts a llama thing that can move at super speed as well as a giant floating creature called an Akanti. Oh hey, the entity from the stone came back. And they killed it. What the f man, we were supposed to get paid for capturing that. Anyways, the Guardians escape on the Milano after watching what the thing did to the giant monster and we start a flight sequence that honestly should be considered a form of cruel and unusual punishment. Seriously, any game that can be played on mouse and keyboard should never have a flight sequence. And if it does, you should mandatorily make it so you have to play on a controller. Just saying. We exit the quarantine zone and are immediately shot down by the Nova Corps. For those who don't know Marvel, they're basically the police officers of the galaxy. Don't ask how they enforce this, I lack that knowledge just as much as you do. We get an incoming call from the leader of the Hallis Hope, which is the ship that shot us down, and DAMN! I mean, DAMN. Who called the police? The leader of the Hallis Hope is someone named Corel, who was Peter's romantic love interest during the Galactic War. That's right, instead of Peter being down bad for Gamora, it's a captain of the Nova Corps. And honestly, I don't blame him. As Corel is interrogated, us, we're forced to make a decision of hiding the llama thing from the quarantine zone or illegal tech that Rocky was planning to make use of. Certain decisions like this are going to be placed intermittently throughout the story and what we decide to choose will affect the game later on like this one. So I'll tell you what I chose and reference back to it later. As of now, I opted to hide the tech. We're put into handcuffs on the Nova ship and are introduced to a child cadet named Nikki who has a sharp tongue. Aren't you a little young for the core? Aren't you a little old for that hairdo? <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's crazy. Oh yeah, there's also this weird priest looking dude, but I'm pretty sure he's not integral to the story at all. <laughs> Whoopsie daisy, please don't go after the child Peter- God damn it! Peter jumps in after the girl and we are introduced to quick time events that I didn't know were in the game, so I ended up killing myself the first time. Take two. Okay. Now is that so hard? We help Nikki get to the captain's quarters so she can report the incident to Corel and how this child isn't afraid of death is honestly beyond me. The two move through the ship's internal passageways and make it to Nikki's secret hideout which I can confidently say will probably be important later. In this hideout we find out that Corel is actually Nikki's mom and uses this place to get away from her because she's a rebellious teenager and is okay with putting her life in danger. This also means that Corel is a MILF and further entices me to make use of the word would. We reunite her and Corel and defend her from giving away the admin passkey that she stole from her mom. This gives her enough trust in Peter to sneak the keycard into his pocket that will be used later. After taking the fall for her, we go alone into the captain's quarters where Corel finds us 8,000 credits and, well, I don't want to describe what happens next, so here's Pro ZD saying it. Oh, they fucking. Oh, they fuck. Oh, hey, we're back on the Milano where we have to break the news to the rest of the crew that we have an $8,000 fine we have to cover in three days. Everyone begins arguing amongst themselves, and Groot suggests he sells himself to the animal collector Lady Hellbender in a non-prostitutional way. Rocket refuses this idea and Drax backs him up saying that Lady Hellbender would prefer someone who is more monstrous on the inside and they both suggest that Rocket should be the one that's sold. Gamora backs up Groot and it's up to us to make the decision. This is one of those important gameplay choices and I chose to sell Rocket because look at Groot. He is way too innocent and there is not a thought behind those eyes. We head off to Seknarf 9 which is the home of Hellbender's fortress and we're forced to make a crash landing because Peter was a dumbass for not listening to Rocket on descent. As the crew make their way to the fortress we are attacked by 
Princess of Minecraft slimes, an alien mantine, a blue demo dog, and witness a giant tentacle emerge from the bottom of a canyon. Nice try, but I've also seen this plot before. So quick side note, while you're in combat, the developers did add character dialogue to flesh out personalities and interpersonal dynamics, but they only added like a few set amount of lines per chapter because my god it is repetitive and after like the third or fourth fight you begin to hear the same lines from the same characters and it gets pretty annoying. Yeah, I was only able to find two in these clips, but it gets worse later on. Anyways, after a bit more exploring, the Guardian Sands Gamora fall into a pit of quicksand slime, and just as we're about to drown, we are introduced to one of the final combat mechanics, Elemental Shots. Elemental Shots are special ammunition that when fired at an enemy weak to that element creates Stagger, which is a short stun that also multiplies damage you dish out. It also has practical uses in and out of combat when solving puzzles during chapters. We make it out of the quicksand slime with Peter's Ice Shot, kill some more demo dogs, find a cage for rockets, to sell the illusion that he's a monster and are shown a beautiful scene of Lady Hellbender's fortress that I would have enjoyed more if they didn't force me to press the W key on what should have been an automatic animation. Peter zones out and we're back in his old house on Earth as a teenager and I think my initial reaction to finally showing his face as a teen was appropriate. Oh my god, oh, he's right. so ugly. We'll see about that. His mom unveils a custom cake she made and tells us to go upstairs to get the gift for us that was planned from our deadbeat, I mean alien, father. We peek into the gift and the screen transitions back to us at the entrance of Lady Hellbender's fortress. We persuade the guards and take an elevator to her and DAMN! Fuck man, I can't keep being caught lacking like this. We uncage Rocket to Lady Hellbender who straight laughs in his face. And this opens up a segment I like to call, How Disrespected Is Rocket? I'm not even joking when I say that even for a pyromaniac, he is still the voice of reason for the Guardians and this scene alone begins a constant chain of being outvoted and ignored for the rest of the game. It's seriously messed up. After a short conversation, Lady Hellbender figures out that we're trying to con her and so Rocket opts to fight our way out. And this is where one of the decisions we made earlier goes into effect. Had we chosen Groot, she would have accepted our offer of 9,000 units and we would have needed to complete a stealth sequence to rescue them later. Regardless, we escape down a conveniently placed hole and end up somewhere in the depths of her fortress. I won't lie, I got embarrassingly stuck on this part where the security drone tries to kill us because for the life of me, I couldn't figure out that I needed to turn around. Rocket suggests robbing Hellbender's vault that we saw earlier and we make our way to it. I won't show every fight scene because at this point it's all the same stuff, just different enemy models, but I will share if something interesting happens. We maneuver our way through, fighting more guards in the process and break into her secret stash. Just as we're about home free, plot twist, Lady Hellbender goes full Hitler on us and turns the room into a gas chamber. Is that weird that makes me even more attracted to her? We break out of the vault by throwing a rock at a wall, I'm serious, and jump down another conveniently placed hole where Lady Hellbender meets us at the bottom and reveals her greatest trophy, the Dweller in Darkness. To beat the boss, we have to circumcise the monster by chopping off its tentacles, which we do by freezing them and having Gamora cut them off with her sword. After we do that, we begin the second stage of the boss fight, which then we have to freeze the monsters it's birthing out of its head and chuck them straight back at it. After about 5 minutes of doing this, we kill the creature and escape in an opening that its dead body created. The Guardians steal a couple of vehicles Mario Kart style and escape to the Milano with a bounty on our heads. With the credits we stole enough to pay back our fine, Peter tries to call the Hallis Hope only to be met with distorted signals from Nikki because the llama decided to eat the entire communication system. This justifiably pisses off Rocket because he is the only one that could fix everything and gets to work. Guardians attempt to track down the Nova Corps ship so they can remove the lock they installed on the Milano and locate it on a Nova station on a giant asteroid aptly named The Rock. Wow. Because no one on the station is responding, the Guardians assume something is wrong and prepares for combat. During this time of preparation, we're allowed to explore the ship and talk to the other members, and we talk to Gamora about an assassin's ring we found in the vault. For some reason, she looks like she's holding an invisible sandwich while giving us backstory on her killer past, but you do you, girl, I guess. During the lulls and downtime in between chapters, the optional interactions between characters really help in giving them depth as well as lore on this iteration of the Marvel Universe. I mean, look at how much character is behind on what Drax says just as we're about to leave the Ship. This reminds me of when I surrendered to the authorities. What was it like? Liberating. What the fuck? <laughs> we exit to an eerily quiet station and play a mini game of redirecting wires. We then come across 
uh, Bucky Barnes? Who is this dude? We finally encounter some Nova Corps officers who attempt to kill us, so now we're forced to fight back. Remember, kids, it's not murder if they shoot at you first, and don't take that seriously. We fight through some more guards, and Rocket suggests that we leave right now because we didn't sign up to be attacked by an entire armada, once again being the voice of reason. Peter refuses to leave, which pisses off Rocket, but he is forced to follow as everyone else agrees with the raccoon. We sneak through the station and come across some more guards worshipping an obelisk looking thing with a giant priest like figure looming behind them. Is that Nikocado Avocado? But we fight our way back to the Milano and make it out alive. Since Rocket is once again justifiably angry about being tossed into a battle he didn't want to participate in, he says that he and Groot are quitting the Guardians. We dock on nowhere to alert someone named Cosmo who is the head of security. Be good to see Cosmo again. I guess I kind of miss the old boy. How exactly do you know him? Was he also a prisoner of the Chitauri? Is it Cosmo nope, the space right dog? Here, back when I was in the <laughs> Ravagers. <laughs> That'd be nuts if it was. So this is foreshadowing. We head down the elevator and I just want to say that even though this game is a buggy mess, the stills and environment is so pretty to look at. Oh hey look, it's Mantis. No damn here though, her bug guys creep me out. In this universe, she's a schizophrenic who can see the future in the multiverse and the way that we know that is she spoils Drax's entire character arc, but you wouldn't know that until 10 hours later when you're near the end of the game. After Mantis gets dragged away by her bodyguards, we explore the Nowhere Marketplace and find our way to Cosmo. Drax and Gamora split up, so Peter is left to roam the city by himself. You know, of all the places in this game, this was my favorite place to walk around in because everything was so vivid and felt accurate to the movies and comics. Combine that with all the bits of lore and references, it truly felt like we were on the planet of nowhere. After a bit of exploring around, Peter finds Drax looking out at the edge of the universe and wow! This is one of the prettiest things I've ever seen in a video game. We walk up to him and he tells us why he left the exploration group. Every time he's on Nowhere, he comes to the edge of the universe because it makes him feel closer to his wife and child who died to Thanos during the Galactic War. Peter and Drax have a heart to heart with Peter talking about losing his mom and Drax talks about losing his family. No one should die without meaning, Peter Quill. My wife, Hovat, and my daughter, Camaria. It died without meaning. I think I know what you mean, man. My mom won the uh, Shatara game. She also died for no reason. They just shot her. But at least she's in a better place now. All right, enough of the sob story, we got a head of security to find. We continue through the city and out of nowhere, get it, we're jumped by the Blood Brothers. Their powers are that their strength and durability is dependent on how close they are in proximity to each other and wait, what is that song I'm hearing in the distance? We have to survive until Gamora and Drax come and save our ass and just as we're about to beat them, we're knocked out by some mysterious force. Called it! As we are passed out, we resume the flashback of Peter and his mom at the house on his 13th birthday. Our mom explains the gift in the box is a birthright from our father, who, I had to look this up, is the king of Spartax. That's right, in this game, he's not half celestial but half Spartoi royalty, which makes him a prince of a planet that, also in this game, no longer exists. So we do end up finding out why this flashback has consistently been on Peter's mind. It turns out, on his birthday, Chitari forces crash down on his house in an attempt to kidnap him. His mom does her best to fend them off, but is ultimately shot and killed as he's being taken away. The flashback ends there and we're awoken by Cosmo the space dog who found Groot and Rocket trying to break into something called the Continuum Cortex and he thought it was the work of all five of them. After explaining why we arrived on Nowhere and explaining the Nova Corps situation, we learn that the cult that's also behind this is known as the Universal Church of Truth. We promise to collaborate with Cosmo and re-explore the rock to find Corel and learn more about the church in exchange for dropping the charges against these two bozos is trespassing. We use the Continuum Cortex which we find out is a giant interdimensional hand that can transport people through space time. And while we're traveling, we're met with a cute little reference. Avengers, assemble. The hand directly teleports us to the Hallis Hope, and while we're fixing the gravity, we are given access to our second elemental shot, Lightning, which during combat damages multiple enemies at once. We explore the ship, fight more guards along the process, and almost be driven mad by the same five repeating voice lines. Quill's killing Luffy cops now. Music to my ears. Quill's killing Luffy cops now. 
music to my ears. We venture into the location where the Grand Unifier's ship blew up. That's him, by the way. Don't know why I haven't put that in the script already. And in its place is some sort of energy absorbing cannon that I'm pretty sure has no plot relevance whatsoever. A little while later, the Guardians stumble into Nikki's hideout. I told you it would be plot relevant. And it's revealed that Peter may be Nikki's dad. Please do not make him a father. I am begging you. After failing to find any sign of her in her hideaway, a little farther down we find the captain's quarters. The room is covered in cryptic messages from what I assume is a Zodiac killer, and after probing Carell's computer, Rocket finds all the records on the ship erased. In order to find what happened, he says that you have to get to the command center, which is conveniently down the hall next to the captain's quarters. After attempting to cross the glass tunnel toward the bridge, it breaks on us thanks to Rocket. We fight one of the priests, and it turns out they're just giant robots, and technically speaking, you can call these mechas. We make it to the command center after the brawl, and Nikki's passkey finally comes in handy because the rest of us don't have to search around the room for a passcode. Combing through the files provides us with a lot of in-game lore and I'm not gonna lie, I kinda got interested in reading everyone's files. And after going through everything, we find a video on what happened. Turns out, Corell decided to go into the quarantine zone after the Guardians left and gets murked by the entity that Quill released. Uh, turns out, the entity did have importance to the plot. Who would have thought? Conveniently, after we decide to exit the files, Grand Unifier Raker teleports in out of nowhere trying to act like he's Jesus. His ship, the Sacrosanct, consumes the Hallow's Hope and... Is his ship just a floating rock? Cold born out of faith and your ship is a rock? Oh my god. We're taken in by Raker and his priest, which is where he pitches his Ponzi scheme of turning the whole universe toward fulfilling the promise. Uh, whatever that is. Kill this energy. Energy. I it looks like Please. Adam Please Warlock or Nova Prime. This is foreshadowing. While he's yapping, Peter and Gamora buy time for Rocket to hack the drone next to Raker so that we can make an escape and call the Milano because Cosmo hasn't been answering us. We make it to the top of the magical escalator where we meet their god, the Matriarch. Vicky. Oh, what? Huh? No. They're using the child? Nah. So disregarding the morality and ethics of brainwashing a child and employing her as a god, we try to convince her that whatever Raker is telling her isn't real and she really did not like that. She holds up the soul stone in her hand and we now come to experience what the promise actually is. Basically, the entity takes our deepest regrets or people dear to us who have died and traps us in an eternal flashback where we get to save that person and their death never occurred. For us playing as Peter, we are transported back to the farmhouse in Missouri and Peter is able to jump out the window and use our battle experience to save save our mom. A fun thing that the devs decided to incorporate is that the first time you are in The Promise, you're forced to play through it and the credits decide to roll until you decide to rethink it a la Persona 5. So in order to escape it, you have to kill the source of your regret, which is majorly fucked. I'm not gonna lie to you, I really did not like pointing the gun at our mom. After we uh, kill her. The voice of Corell transports us to Nikki's promise, which is her preparing a surprise party for Corell on the Hallow's Hope with Peter assisting her. In her promise, Peter is her actual father and they are one happy family on the ship. We help her repair a solar system hologram and as Corell comes in for the surprise, her spirit lunges at us and explains to us that, uh, she's dead. Yeah. They just decide to kill the bad MILF, I mean, Nikki's only family. The only reason she's able to communicate with us is because since us three touched the soul stone, all of our souls became linked together, which... Doesn't make a lot of sense if I'm being honest. What's really fucked, however, is because Corell no longer has a tangible body, her soul is being held hostage by her 12 year old daughter's delusion. I'm not even kidding when I say she's being diavoloed by her own kid. <laughs> Oh hey look, digression. Because we rejected the promise, we now have to fight the high priests. After that, we look for an escape route where we're forced to go through the middle of the ship where all the followers are. This is honestly a terrifying scene. Can you imagine in real life millions of people giving up their autonomy to forever live in a lie because they don't want to live in the real world? Wait a sec. So we hijack a few floating platforms and after a few waves of followers, we finally make it to the rendezvous spot for the Milano. Along the way, Gamora chases after Raker herself, which we don't stop because it will help later on in the story. The spot where the Milano is supposed to show up is filled with batteries, which by the way are powered by faith, and we allow Rocket to rig some of them to explode so we can slow down the Church of Truth. Batteries get set off and after a bit of sliding, the Guardian Sands Gamora are launched into the depths of 
space where the Milano conveniently picks us up just as we're about to freeze to death. Gamora appears back on the ship with Raker's arm which will weaken him later when we have his boss fight. Since Cosmo didn't answer us earlier, we contact him after Rocket admits the communication system wasn't actually that broken. He tells us that we have to speak to the World Mind which is the Nova Corps supercomputer and convince them to help in taking down the church. The call is interrupted because the Milano is ambushed by Captain Glory and the Lethal Legion who were people we read about earlier on the Hallis Hope Logs. Fun fact, his actual name is Glory. Yep. As the conversation between Captain Glory Hole and the Guardians are taking place, Rocket tells us to stall for him and this is where opting to hide the illegal tech comes into play. Since we hid the tech instead of the llama, he was able to upgrade the weapon system on the Milano. This begins a dogfight sequence and I mean this genuinely when I say I wouldn't force someone to play this even if they were my worst enemy. I hated this part. If you thought the first chapter was bad, this is even worse. For some reason, the developers decided to amp up the sensitivity by like 10 times when controlling the Milano, which makes aiming possibly the worst thing I have ever experienced in a video game. No joke, I spent 8 minutes fighting ships when in reality it shouldn't have taken more than 3. I was so happy when I finished this part and I hope I never have to experience that ever again. This is foreshadowing. After defeating Captain Glory Hole, the Guardians head to Xandar to convince the World Mind to aid in defeating the church. We're taken to a directory that I got lost in for way too long, and we summon the planetary supercomputer by paying our fine. And already blasting about it. I can't believe that worked. Me neither. The world mind comes out to talk to us and we try to convince it that the church can be taken down. We fail obviously because a computer can't process human emotions but we do end up planting seeds of doubt in the world mind who then gives us instructions to seek out Adam Warlock, the church's original god that I called earlier. We decide to rest after everything that's happened and after we wake up we find out that Drax has succumbed to the promise and has locked everyone in the room. In order to get out we have to guide the llama towards the wires so that it can chew through them to release the locks. Turns out while we were all asleep. Drax took us to Lamentus to hunt down a person who apparently is the only one who can foil that pixelated entity's plans. As he's about to kill a native, Mantis appears and takes down Drax as well as subduing him using her powers. Apparently in order for this timeline to win against the church, we must save Drax with the answer being somewhere on this planet and it all begins at this cave entrance that for some reason I feel obligated to censor. We head down into the depths of the cave and we encounter magical smoke that forces us to fight enemies that we faced in previous chapters. Here we are introduced to the last mechanic which is the mega ability that is unlocked when a guardian reaches a turning point in their character arc. Because we mandatorily fight the nightmare smoke enemies, we unlock Peter's mega ability known as the shield of Spartax which is temporary and vulnerable ability that I didn't use once for the rest of the game. A bit more adventuring and we come across a face shaped rock wall that is the source of the nightmare smoke. Feeling dejected after traveling so far down, which I'm not gonna lie, I am too, I've been in this cave for 45 minutes, Peter gives a pep talk to the rest of the guardians which causes the nightmare smoke to create hostile duplicates of them. In order to get rid of the fog, Rocket has to go inside the crevices and blow up the rock face from the inside. Unfortunately, he refuses because I forgot to mention that he's afraid of water due to the experiments he was subjected to inside of sensory deprivation takes in his home on half world how many times i gotta tell you people i don't like water uh-uh no way no flarkin way it doesn't seem that wet like medium wet i ain't walking through a flarkin monsoon it's nothing okay just the lab i was in detests on me in tubes of water and it sucked it really really sucked sensory deprivation experiments on half world i heard of those Sensory deprivation was like a vacation compared to the other things. How I managed to completely leave out that important sub-character arc about 30 minutes into this video is beyond me, but I'm 9 pages in and I refuse to add it somewhere earlier, so you're getting this information now. You are welcome. After watching his friends be taken hostage by the fog smoke thing, he conquers his trauma and goes into the waterlogged hole in the wall, and thanks to him we finally reach the end of the cave where we find the person that Drax and Mantis have been looking for. We also unlock his mega ability along the way. Just like I called it with Cosmo the Space Dog before, in pops Adam Warlock who only speaks in alliteration and poetry for some fucking reason. My heavenly healing is veiled malignance, a first folly I swore never to repeat. What protection I can proffer is to remain reclusive. Oh my god, 
Shut up, dude. We enter his cocoon where Mantis explains that in order to fix Drax, the Guardians have to enter his mind with Adam and pull him out of the delusion created by the entity. We enter Drax's mindscape and follow his echo where all of us encounter Thanos, who keeps duplicating, and we have to let him kill us. As we go deeper into his mind, the entity thing drags him further down into the delusion and to catch up to him, we have to fight at spawn that once again I feel obligated to censor. After doing this two more times, we enter the core of his promise and have a heart to heart with him about his family. He knows that his family isn't coming back, but he's afraid that he has nothing without them. Peter Quill, my family is gone. What sits before me? I don't know. But it's not real. It ain't good. It is a perversion fed by desperation. Without it, I will have nothing. I cannot be alone again. You're not alone, man. We're here for you. This, in my opinion, is where the game really excels in. It deals with grief and trauma in a really humane way and displays the real emotions that people go through when they lose someone they love. I just wish that the voice actor for Peter didn't sound like he was stuck in the goddamn 90s. So Drax kills his family and out pops the real form of the entity. Yeah, that is a sentence. Adam and the Entity fuse, and as we return to the surface, he gives us the origin story of DAMN! That man is caked! <coughs> uh, we are given the origin story of the Entity and come to find out its name is Magus. And in the shadows it spoke. Weak whelps, pernicious priesting, feeble fools fit for feasting. Hubris made hunger, a cancerous craving called Magus. A galaxy destroying entity and its name is Magus. Even the game finds it stupid, it gives us the option to call his bullshit. According to Adam, it's an entity that formed from his dark twisted desires after becoming the church's god. He consulted Raker to help remove Magus from his body through the use of the soul stone on his head which was successful until the guardians decided to play fuck around and find out. We make it to the surface and find out that Nikki and the church have taken control of the continuum cortex. They decided they wanted to cosplay as imperialists and decided to destroy all of Lamentus. You know, for a church that wants to convert people into their religion, I don't think decimating the entire native population is the way to go, but hey, what do I know? Us along with Adam Warlock evacuate the planet and leave Mantis behind so she can help remaining survivors. We head to nowhere and discover the planet has already been overrun by the church. Once the Milano lands, we fight some followers and unlock Drax's mega ability after rescuing him from the promise. Adam decides to abandon the Guardians while we're still in the air and along the way we also learn about Gamora's origin story after seeing a child be taken by high priests. These two events are mutually exclusive, I just couldn't think of a smooth transition for either event. But like Drax, she airs out the personal grievances she's been holding and turns out after the Galactic War, she was forced to kill her sister Nebula because she was so sick in the head and it was implied that she was still loyal to Thanos. My sister, if I had just been better at protecting Nebula, maybe, maybe she wouldn't be dead. Whoa, what? Nebula's dead? How? By who? Tell me, so I can find him and shake his protecting hand. By me. Peter, being the oh-so-charismatic leader that he is, convinces her to stay with the Guardians and we unlock her mega ability. Raker decides to come to us and just as we're about to die, Adam Warlock decides to reunite with the Guardians and hops in to save him. Blood thinks he's the main character or something, I don't know. Anyways, this pisses Raker off, especially after learning Mr. Warlock faked his death and fights Adam. Us being ground-based individuals have to fight our way past followers and try to catch up to them. We come across Cosmo, who is doing his best to fend off followers, but he succumbs to the promise and after defeating the surrounding enemies, we talk him out of it. Cosmo is great we saved him and promises he will reunite with us after he fixes nowhere. He also tells us that the Continuum Cortex is being held hostage and the Guardians have to free it to stop the fulfillment of the promise from happening. We get down there first being stopped by a pile of ashes that couldn't register my jump and we destroy the mechanism keeping it hostage. So game over, all is hunky dory right? No. Not even fucking close. The Continuum Cortex was just meant to help ease the process of the fulfillment for Nikki and the ritual is still going to occur on the Sacrosanct. Breaker takes Adam as his prisoner because Blood was not the main character and now we have to find a way to fight our way into the ship to save Nikki. After a bit of brainstorming, they decide on requesting help from the woman who he conned, vandalized her place, straight robbed from and killed her pets, Lady Hellbender. You know, thinking back, she had every right to be angry with us and put a bounty on our heads, but I digress. We head off to Maklu 4, which is the home of the legendary dragon Fin Fang Foom, who by by the way in the original 
comics looks like this. And because the stones from the planet's ring constantly rain down on the planet, we are forced to make a crash landing in a nearby force. This part was particularly painful because my mouse didn't want to go further than two inches to the left and right, so I was stuck here for seven minutes. In fact, it got so bad, I had to pick up my controller and use it for this part. So we crash land in the woods, venture down the mountain, unlocking Peter's last elemental shot fire, which deals damage over time, and fight some Bigfoot looking beasts who ambush us. Oh yeah, we also unlocked the wind shot earlier, but I never mentioned it because I didn't end up using it in combat once. Look, at this point, there's nothing much I can explain other than the plot. It's the same gameplay for like 16 hours now, so I'm really just going to compress these last few chapters. You make it to the base of the mountain and discover a huge camp that was raised by Foom. The camp was there to hunt and kill the beast for a huge sum of money, but the reason we are here is because we want to bring Foom alive as a piece of offering to the animal queen. A little further down we make it to a giant obelisk stone and out of the ice pops the legendary beast. Wait, that's not the comic book foom. This commences the boss fight and just like the dweller in darkness we fought earlier, the first stage is dealing enough damage to destroy his armor and immobilize it and after that the second stage has us hurl objects that he summons straight back at him. The boss fight ends with us accidentally killing him instead of capturing it but then Lady Hellbender shows up along with Mantis to show us the results of our work. She's obviously not happy because a person who built a sanctuary for wild animals is currently looking at the corpse of a skyscraper sized dragon but out of nowhere Groot reveals that he can just revive things. <laughs> yeah, because that just so happens to be convenient to the plot. We broker a deal with Hellbender for allowing her and Foom to finally be united and she promises us to aid us in our attack on the church. She heads back to Seknarf Naim to gather her forces and we head to the Sacrosanct with Mantis to wait for her. Rocket doesn't think she'll show up in time so he takes Peter's Walkman and launches it into the depths of outer space while we slowly flow past. Turns out Lady Hellbender didn't lie to us and she pops in with her army. We commence a dogfight sequence that, once again, I cannot even begin to describe how much this should be considered a form of capital punishment and man just takes the reins on the Milano as we drop into the floating rock no problem. We're fashioned with golden suits because of course we are it's the epic final battle and we fight our way into the depths of the ship. So this is where the culmination of all our previous decisions of helping everyone steps in. As we continue to fight through the ship Cosmo and the world mine assist us in getting past massive hordes of enemies that had we not picked the right answers while talking to them wouldn't have showed up. Comes in with the entire planet of nowhere and the world mine hacks into the power source of the robot priest and forces them to malfunction. We make it to the heart of the ship and after Raker finishes his prototypical evil monologue, the Guardians sneak up after he leaves and frees Adam. He unfortunately do not make it in time to prevent the fulfillment, and as we are being stopped by Raker, Chekhov's gun is finally fired and the voice of Corel drags us back into Nikki's promise, where this time Peter has to convince her to leave it for the fate of the universe, of course. We replay our flashback of the surprise birthday party, but as we open the door for Corel, we have one more conversation with their soul and plot twist. Nikki is not actually Peter or Corel's biological father. Daughter. Fuck. <laughs> She's a war orphan. So armed with the new knowledge that Peter and Nikki are not blood related, meaning that everything about the scene we are living in is a lie, we talk her out of the promise. And this part to me is really sad because Nikki knows that her mother isn't coming back, but she blames herself for her mother's death because she snuck into the mining ring against her mother's orders. The only reason she lives in this little loop is because she keeps hoping that for once the person that will come through the door for her surprise is actually her mom well and alive. I need her back. I don't care if it's not real. I need things to go back to how they were, even if it means making the same stupid game for all stupid eternity. Just the thought that she might come back is better than admitting that she never will. And that... And then it's all my fault. If I hadn't distracted her... You're not the reason she's gone, Nick. Don't put that on yourself. Why not? It's true. If I had just... It's not true. You didn't make that thing. You didn't release it. You're not the reason your mom was where she was. There's a lot of blame to go around, but there is no way you deserve any of it. Once we finally talk her down and promise to help her deal with her grief, she finally rejects the false reality through the power of the soul stone and has a badass superhero transformation. I have never heard of the comic book hero Nikki Gold in my entire life. So Adam jumps into the machine in place of Nikki to absorb Magus and we begin the final fight. I can't believe after 18 hours of gameplay, it turns out Raker did have plot significance. To keep it real with you guys though, this fight was incredibly boring. All this really was was shooting down Raker's energy shield, spamming abilities when he was staggered and getting blinded occasionally. It was pretty bad for a final fight and it was over in like 5 minutes. Adam finishes absorbing Magus and the galaxy is now freed from a galaxy destroying entity. We walk off like superheroes and the credits start to roll. Fabulous. Oh, come on. 
Are you fucking serious? Yeah, so turns out the game isn't over. We now have to fight Magus himself. In order to defeat him, we have to trap him into the same thing that released him in the first place, which is the Soul Stone. Being a little bitch that he is, he refuses to get close to us because he knows that we have it in our back pocket. Our objective is to provoke him so we can get close enough to trap him. We do a bit of fighting, avoid some meteors, and after a short while, he finally gets angry enough to attack us himself. And you're not going to believe how this shit ends. For one, I have to mute these last three minutes because the song of choice to end the game is final countdown by Europe. And not only that, but the final sequence is a bunch of quick time events, which is the same way that the Avengers game ends. <laughs> After the stone gets knocked around a bit, Peter sacrifices himself to trap Magus because he feels responsible for letting him out. We pan back to the Milano because the entire thing happened in a dreamscape thanks to Mantis and Groot revives Peter. We entrust the stone to Adam off the advice of Mantis and he promises to call us should he need assistance. With that, the game ends. So some final thoughts, I thought the game was fine. In terms of gameplay, it got really repetitive starting as early as chapter 3, but the story in my opinion is really good. The devs did a really good job of taking really mature themes and adjusting it so that it fits into a prototypical Marvel narrative that everyone can digest. I was kind of thrown off by how different the characters are in comparison to the movies just because that's how I was introduced to Marvel, but I ended up really enjoying their interactions, especially since they stayed true to their movie and comic book counterparts. One thing I do want to rip on though is just like the last game from Square Enix, there were a lot of plot conveniences for the sake of progressing the story. Sometimes how you would enter gameplay felt really forced because it's just like, oh, let's jump down this hole or oh, conveniently there's a crack in the wall. But I can't give too much fault because that's how linear games tend to be in the first place. But to wrap it up, if you like games that are more story oriented, I would definitely give this game a chance. And for my overall score, it'd be an 8 out of 10 because the combat really ruined it for me near the end. Other than that though, that's it. Subscribe and have a good day.